Hello, uh, my name is Kino Weber Shirk. I work with North Carolina Cooperative Extension in Guilford County. I'm a county extension agent supporting community and school gardens. Over 150 community and school gardens have been started in our area, and I'm here in the teaching garden today to talk about pollinators. When we talk about pollinators, a pollinator is often an insect, but not exclusively insects, that go to a flower to get nectar. They're drawn by the nectar or the pollen, and while they're there, they get pollen on themselves so that when they go to the next flower, they cross-pollinate the flowers. And that's something that then fertilizes our vegetables or our flower seed. Often we think about butterflies as pollinators or honeybees, but hummingbirds are also large pollinators when they come to the large showy flowers to go get that nectar. They get the pollen on their feathers before they go off to the next flower. So there's really a large cross section of pollinators and these are all beneficial insects in our gardens. Beetles are pollinators, butterflies and moths pollinate, honeybees, which we're most familiar with, but North America also has over 4,000 species of native bees. So these are often wild bees or solitary bees that are much smaller and non-aggressive. So those are also good pollinators, as well as flies, which are sometimes more pests, but they, they do play the role of pollination in the garden. Bumblebees, the larger bees that you might see. Carpenter bees, even larger than bumblebees. And then wasps are pollinators. When we were looking at the dill plant behind me, this is an example of a, of a great pollinator plant. These yellow flowers are really attractive to pollinators. So I saw some, some honeybees, some wasps, some small flies are all being attracted to this plant here. And that's a great thing to have in the garden because right nearby in the teaching garden, we have cucumbers and tomatoes, plants that are really dependent on on these pollinators to cross-pollinate and produce their fruits. One of the things that the teaching garden does really well is to incorporate flowering shrubs and plants that will flower for a long time throughout the season. A lot of showier flowers will be really brief and they'll provide a food source for pollinators for a short period of time. But when thinking about creating a pollinator habitat throughout the season, it's important to incorporate plants that will flower in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall. So there's a food source for pollinators throughout the season. So right here you can see that there are, this is a really active butterfly bush and that bees are coming all the time. One resource that I want to share with you all is from the Xerces Society, and we'll link to this as well. Um, but this is a habitat assessment that you can do in your own backyard, in a community garden or a school garden, or in a public place. And what this assessment really helps us work through is to create a robust habitat for our pollinators and to create a place where they can continue to grow and thrive. In addition to having a food source and a forage source for pollen, it's also important to incorporate places for them to get water, as well as having nesting sites and places that pollinators can overwinter. So one, one example of a nesting site that I wanted to share with you all is an example of reuse or upcycling. We have the 4,000 species of wild or solitary bees, and these are bees that live by themselves. They don't live in hives like honeybees do. So this is an example of a community service project that some sixth graders did to create a wild bee hotel. Because there are different species that are different sizes, they prefer um, nests that are different sizes as well. So this is reused paper, paper straws of different sizes as well as bamboo. And the idea with a wild bee hotel like this is that it's protected from the elements, it's protected from rain and wind, and that in each of these tubes, a bee, a female bee, will enter the tube and lay an egg and put some food source and then seal it up. And she may put as many as six or eight um, eggs in this tube, which then grow to their full size before hatching. In nature, these pollinators would be using dried flowered stems or old wood, but if that's not around in your habitat, you can create something to mimic it. And there are excellent plans online for creating your own wild bee hotels. 
There is so much information out there to help you learn more about pollinators, pollinator conservation, and what you can do to create a robust pollinator habitat in your yard or garden. This was meant to be just an overview to highlight what the High Point Public Library Teaching Garden is doing to draw more pollinators to their space. To learn more, you can visit the High Point Public Library website or North Carolina Cooperative Extension. There are links to the habitat assessment that we talked about from the Xerces Society, information to citizen science projects to learn more about pollinators and pollinator observation, as well as recommended plant lists for different gardening spaces and habitats to draw pollinators to your space. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. I'm Mark Taylor and I'm with the High Point Public Library Teaching Garden. For more information, contact us directly or go to our website, 